Uh, hush over the crowd. Good evening and welcome. And this is the ninth annual Emergency Preparedness Town Hall Forum. And I'm Richard Kite, the mayor of the city of Rancho Mirage. And before, thank you. The, the great city of Rancho Mirage. Uh, before we get going tonight, I'd like to uh, have a little survey here and see how many of you are here for the first time tonight. Would you raise your hands? Well, that's great. Okay. This is the, uh, the ninth one we've done, and uh, every, every year the audience gets larger and we try and improve the, the program. So tonight, hopefully, you'll really enjoy the program that we're going to present to you, and you'll all go home a lot wiser and know a lot more about protecting yourself during a disaster. So we will, uh, first of all, say a little bit about the vendors that are out in the uh, outside lobby. I'm sure you saw them as you came in, and they are pre preparing, or they're actually providing emergency preparedness goods and services for you to purchase. On other tables, also out in that area, there's a variety of preparedness information at no cost, so that's a good deal. And I urge you to take advantage of the opportunity to prepare now by making purchases and gathering information to become better prepared. At the conclusion of the program tonight, we're going to have a raffle and we'll have some prizes for you to take home. So if you received a bag, there is a ticket on that bag and we will be doing some drawings uh, before you all leave tonight. So let's begin. We're all aware of the importance of preparing for a major earthquake. Experts believe we are certainly overdue for the big one because there has not been a significant quake in this lower valley since the 1600s. So we're all waiting for the big one along with the rest of you. The staff of the City of Palm Desert and the City Council are really uh, appreciative of the city's uh, Emergency Preparedness Commission that has organized this event tonight. And with their efforts, they get out and they talk about emergency preparedness in the community, meet with homeowners groups and businesses, and hopefully get all of you prepared for when the big one does arrive. At this time, I'd like to introduce the members of the commission that are here tonight. They're all down here in the front row, so if you'd stand when I call your name and you can hold your applause till they're all standing. First of all, the chairman, Fred Sanchez. Fred? Commissioner Michael Adams. Commissioner Roger Berry. Commissioner Doug Bornstein. Commissioner Matthew Lawton and uh, Commissioner Deanie Shaver, Commissioner Phil Shaver, and last but not least, Commissioner Gail Tissier. Gail, now you may applaud. Thank you, they've done a great job and every year they look forward to putting on this forum for all of you and we hope that you'll enjoy it tonight. Also over on this side is the staff liaison from the city of Rancho Mirage, Scott Morgan. Scott? At this time I'd like to present our speaker for this evening, it's Dr. Dennis Maletti. Dr. Dennis Maletti is a professor emeritus at the University of Colorado at Boulder where he served as director of the Natural Hazards Center and chair of the Department of Sociology. He is also the author of over 100 publications and his book, Disasters by Design, is a reassessment of the natural hazards in the United States. He's also served as chair of the Committee of Disasters in the National Academy of Sciences, chair of the Board of Visitors to FEMA's Emergency Management Institute, a board member of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and he continues to work in emergency management as an emergency management consultant for both private firms and government agencies. Dennis has been a permanent resident of the city of Rancho Mirage since 2004. Soon after arriving to our area, he was appointed by the governor as the California Seismic Safety Commissioner. 
and he served as a technical liaison to the Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness since that time. So I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Dr. Dennis Maletti. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you, and thank you very much for coming. I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask before we begin. How many of you have seen the film about earthquake preparedness that the city prepared and has distributed over the last year? Raise your hands if you have. Okay, so most of you haven't. Uh, how the evening's going to go is like this. We're going to watch that film. It's 17 minutes long. We're only going to show 15 minutes of it and stop right at the end of the information that it has to present to you. The reason we're starting that way is we can get everybody here on the same page. And while you're watching the film, see if you can formulate any questions that you might have about earthquakes, our pending earthquake, how to get ready for them, how to make your house safer, how to have emergency supplies and how many, that sort of thing. And when the film's over, what the whole program is designed to do is for me to answer those questions. So with that, we'll start the film. Rancho Mirage offers an abundant amount of sunshine and beauty, a charming and exquisite quality of life to enjoy with clear skies and breathtaking sunsets. It's easy to see why so many people call Rancho Mirage their dream destination. No matter where you live on this planet, Mother Nature is having you prepare for one of her challenges. California is no exception. Here is where we prepare for earthquakes. Hi, I'm Kay Ballard and I live in Rancho Mirage, but most of you have seen me in every restaurant around the valley. I am happy to be here. You know that I was so lucky to find Rancho Mirage as my permanent home. We are so privileged today to have a man who goes all over the world to help people how to prepare for disasters. And he's an expert, Dr. Dennis Maletti, and he lives here in Rancho Mirage, Dr. Dennis Maletti. Scientists have just completed a series of studies that give us brand new information about the earthquake we face in Southern California. And that information is gonna be shared with you here the city is going to make recommendations to you about how you get ready for that earthquake based on the new information. November 2008, U.S. Geological Survey scientists state the most likely large earthquake in California will affect Southern California, the Coachella Valley and Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage may shake for up to two minutes. People in the Coachella Valley and Rancho Mirage should be prepared for the shaking and be ready to be on their own for seven to 10 days. There's one thing to remember. What we need to do is get ready for that earthquake, not the ones we've experienced. And we're lucky to have all that new scientific information. Step one, secure your stuff. Reducing or eliminating hazards throughout your home, workplace, Conduct a hazard hunt to help identify and fix things such as unsecured televisions, computers, bookcases, furniture, and unstrapped water heaters. They can be secured with flexible nylon straps and buckles for easy removal and relocation. Securing these items now will help to protect you tomorrow. In the kitchen, unsecured cabinet doors fly open during earthquakes allowing glassware and dishes to crash to the floor. Hook and eye latches are great and very convenient and not so expensive. Gas appliances should have flexible hoses so they don't tear out of the wall when shaking occurs. That will reduce the risk of fire. 
Secure refrigerators to the walls to reduce the chance of the refrigerator bouncing around and possibly hitting someone during the shaking. Objects on open shelves and tabletops and display stands, collectibles, pottery objects, and lamps can become deadly projectiles. Use Velcro or Earthquake Gel to secure breakables and move heavy items to lower shelves. Hanging objects. Mirrors, frame pictures, and other objects should be hung from earthquake hooks so they can't bounce off the walls. Pictures and mirrors can also be secured at their corners with earthquake putty. Only soft arts, such as tapestries, should be placed over beds and sofas. Large furniture like pianos and beds can be secured to your wall invisibly by using heavy fishing line, so your home can still stay attractive but secure. We've brought together a few of the state, if not the nation's, leading experts uh, to talk to the people in Rancho Mirage. Dr. Lucy Jones is the director of the U.S. Geological Survey Center here in Southern California. You have to consider earthquakes as part of your future. That does not mean you have to leave. Earthquakes can be lived through, but you need to be ready for them. You need to secure your own space. Look at the house you own and make it as secure as you can. You can probably do something to both make the structure stronger and secure the context. Go into your living room and look around the room. Think of that strong shaking and think about what's falling on the floor. Can you afford to lose it? Can you afford to have it hit your head? And can you keep it from falling? All of those probably have a pretty concrete answer. It's not rocket science. It's really plain common sense. If you want to live here, learn to live with your voice. Step two, make and practice preparedness plans. Planning for an earthquake or other emergencies is not much different from planning a party or a vacation. Get together with your family or housemates to plan now what each person will do before, during, and after. By planning now, you will be ready. Make sure that your plans include who will be in charge and the director of your plan. Practice middle-of-the-night plans that should include making sure everyone stays in bed with their heads covered with pillows. Keep a flashlight and sturdy shoes in the dresser next to the bed, not under your bed as they will be shaken away. Sleep with blinds, drapes, or shades drawn to minimize flying shattered glass. You know, it was Dwight Eisenhower when he was president who once said, emergency plans are useless but emergency planning is essential because it familiarizes the people who develop the plan with what they're going to face in a very unfamiliar circumstance. Step three, put supplies in kits, backpacks, and containers. We've got Mark Benthian, who's the Director of Public Education and Outreach for the Southern California Earthquake Center at the University of Southern California. Being in Rancho Mirage, being in the desert where it can be very hot in the summer, of course, you need more water than we may recommend in other parts of California. So it's really good to have at least 18 gallons per person to uh, both be for drinking water as well as for sanitation, for keeping yourself cool if it's hot, and to have that at home and have you know, in, in many formats that you can have stored water. Living in Rancho Mirage, you will need more supplies than just kits. You would need extra supplies so you can make sure you have backpacks and storage containers. Make sure your supplies are in accessible locations at home, at work, or in your vehicle, or where you spend most of your day. Preparedness supplies should also be maintained outside in case your building is badly damaged. Backpacks or other small bags are best for your supplies, so you can take them with you if you have to evacuate. Having emergency supplies readily available, you can reduce the impact of an earthquake or other emergencies. A lot of experts have given a lot of thought to what should be in those kits. Get the list they've developed. But a more fun way to approach it, and a much more personal way to approach it, 
is what I did. I imagined that I was going camping in the middle of the Mojave Desert all alone for 10 days. And I thought, if I were going camping in the middle of the desert, in the middle of summer, what would I want with me? Would I want something to give me shade to be in? Would I want food to eat? Would I want things to drink, etc.? And that's what I put together for my earthquake emergency supplies. Step four, secure your building and finances. Some houses are not safe as they could be. Whether you are a homeowner, renter, or a business owner, there are things that you can do to improve the structural integrity of your home. Some of the things you might consider are checking foundations that need to be bolted down. Consult a contractor or an engineer to help you identify your building's weaknesses and begin to fix them. How much earthquake insurance should you have? Can you afford to replace your household possessions? How much would they cost? Let me put it this way. Uh, you live in California. And if you took three quarters of your financial assets, converted them to cold cash, would you go put them in a bank that's not insured by the FDIC so that if the bank goes broke, you get your money back? You wouldn't, would you? Well, having three quarters of your assets in your home if you live in California in this valley. And an earthquake could happen that could take away part of that financial asset from you. It's just as silly as putting money in a bank not insured by the FDIC, in my opinion. Step five, drop, cover, and hold on. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to the floor take cover under a sturdy desk or table and hold on to it firmly. Be prepared to move with it until it stops shaking. If you are in bed, hold on and stay there, protecting your head with a pillow. You are less likely to be injured staying where you are. In a high rise, drop cover and hold on. Avoid windows and other hazards. Do not use elevators. Outdoors, Move to a clear area if you can safely do so. Avoid power lines, trees, and other potential hazards. Driving. Pull over to the side of the road and stop. Avoid overpasses, bridges, and other potential hazards. Theater. Stay in your seat and protect your head and neck with your arms. At the top of the list. I would say practice dropping to the ground, covering your head and body under a heavy table and desk and holding on to the leg of that table or desk so that as the earthquake has it try to move across the room, you move with it and you keep that protective shelter above you. And don't just think it sounds like something you can do. I actually did it for the first time about a year ago and uh, I needed to practice quite a bit. Uh, to be able to, well, even just get down on the ground. Step six, check for injuries and damages. Now today I'm here to talk to you about damages and injuries that occur as a result of earthquakes. One of the things that we learned from the Loma Prieta earthquake is that people that had CPR and CERT training were better equipped to deal with the circumstances and fared a lot better as a result of what arose from the earthquake. You should all be aware that damages occurred during an earthquake, some more critical than others. Fire, for instance. I would recommend that everybody go out and have at least one, maybe two fire extinguishers at home. That puts you in a position to be able to put out small fires and keep them from spreading and becoming a major issue. Another damage you might incur is a gas leak. You should know how to be able to turn off your gas valve. If you smell gas, or if you hear hissing of gas, whether it's coming from inside the house or by the gas meter, that's a sign to turn it off. Don't try to turn it back on. Contact the gas company and let the professionals do it. It's a possibility there may be down power lines. Approach all power lines as though they're still energized. Stay away from power lines. Don't touch them. Don't touch any objects that may be touching them. Chemical spills. 
use extreme caution with them. You have to clean them up, and you should, but if you're dealing with items such as bleach, petroleum products, lye, what you want to use there is dirt to absorb the chemical. You can also use cat litter. Keep your hands from coming in contact with these types of chemicals as they can be harmful and dangerous to you. Step seven, communicate and recover. We created the seven steps to earthquake safety to make it easier for people to know how to prepare, protect, and recover for major earthquakes. And it's the seventh step which really brings it all home. All that you've done in the first six steps has prepared you to more quickly and where less costs recover from the earthquakes that, go, that are going to happen. And it's the seventh step where you're going to not have the headaches that many people might have because of what you've done to prepare yourself before and during the earthquake. Turn on your portable or car radio for information and safety advisories. Check on the conditions of your neighbors. Until you're sure there are no gas leaks, do not use open flames. Never use the following indoors, camp stoves, gas lanterns or heaters, gas or charcoal grills or gas generators. These can release deadly carbon monoxide or be a fire hazard in aftershocks. If the power is off, plan meals to use up refrigerated and frozen foods first. If you keep the door closed, food in your freezer may be good for a couple of days. If your water is off or has no pressure, or you think it's unsafe, you can drink water from heaters, melted ice cubes, or canned vegetables. Avoid drinking water from swimming pools or spas. Don't eat or drink anything from open containers that's near shattered glass. We cut that beautiful film off before it was over. However, it's available to you and I recommend that you look at it as many times as you'd like. There's a CD of the film in the bags that you got this evening and it's also available on the homepage of the City of Rancho Mirage. If you go to the general homepage and just click on emergency preparedness, that film is on the front of that page. Uh, electronically and is available to you to watch any and as many times as you'd like. So uh, I want to say just one thing before uh, I take questions. And what I want to say is uh, in 2004, I moved to Rancho Mirage. And I could have moved anywhere I wanted to, to move because I retired. I moved out of Colorado and I came here knowing what I know about the earthquake we face. And I have done what I think a reasonable human being should do to be able to cope with that risk, survive it, live through it, and rebuild. And however damaged my house gets, I have in place a plan about how I can rebuild it so that it's just the way it is, exactly the way it is, I'm not going anywhere. And I wanna tell the people who run the city, including the mayor, the reason is, is I think it's the most beautiful town in America. And I'm happy to be here, despite the earthquake hazard we face. So with that, do any of you have any questions I can answer? Yes, in the center. We're coming down with mics. Uh, since we can't predict uh, what season this will hit, uh, what about the intense heat, uh, for instance, of 120 degrees, and what do you store for food that isn't going to explode, expand, or uh, those deteriorate? Are, those are two very good questions. We live in a desert. It could be 115 or 120 degrees. At night, it'll go down to 88 degrees. How are we gonna survive that after this earthquake? Particularly considering that it's most likely 
as is the case with most earthquakes of this size, that no people are going to want to go back into any buildings for a while. So we'll be living outside. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. And I wondered, how did people live in this valley before air conditioning was invented? And I've actually met a few, and I asked them what they did. And they explained what they did. They wet towels, hung them up by windows, put them on top of the tent if they were sleeping in a tent, and invented natural cooling mechanisms and stayed in shade didn't exert a lot of energy when it's hot, et cetera. That's one of the reasons, for example, we were the first uh, governmental entity that stepped forward and said, 72 hours worth of water isn't enough. We need enough water for seven to 10 days because we knew people might be consuming a lot of water for cooling purposes. And that's also why out in the hallway, we have a very simple solution. Have any of you had dinner at a restaurant where there are misters? And you, have you noticed how it cools you? Well, a simple spray bottle that you fill with water and spray every once in a while serves the same function. Now, I realize for a week you can't be sitting there spraying like this, but it's better to have that handy rather than not have it handy. There probably are a variety of other techniques uh, that could be applied. Regarding food, um, some people enjoy having that army food, K-rations or whatever they call them now. Uh, uh, other people do it a different way. I can share with you what I did. I uh, have my house overstocked with food. I've been around the world to many earthquakes in many countries. And one thing I've noticed about food, no food breaks in earthquakes. Food doesn't break. And so I have um, dozens and dozens of cans of tuna fish. And when I go shopping and I shop at Costco, I buy more and put it in the back. And I have a row in my pantry that's just tuna fish. And I eat from the front and replenish from the back. I also have a roll of Hormel chili because I just love it. <laughs> I also have a roll of uh, a row of canned corn. So we're talking 24 cans of canned corn. I have a row of uh, refried beans, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, not that I like eating canned food, but there are some canned food products I enjoy. And I'm overstocked on canned foods, and I'm always rotating the stock. So whenever the earthquake happens, what's in the cupboard, or even if it falls to the floor, it'll be fresh and available for me to eat. If it happened during thank you, if it happened during the summer and I had a can of peaches or as you say, a can of chili or something, and it was in my shed in the backyard and it was 120 degrees Got out it. there. Sorry I misunderstood That's, your question. Well, I maybe didn't phrase it properly. Have you ever seen one of those big chests they put beer in at beach parties? That's what I have available to me. And I keep it filled with other emergency supplies, but it's a place I can relocate my canned food uh, after the event. So uh, not to be, I'm a Costco nut, but they sell really big white ones very inexpensively at Costco. That's what I've got. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, why did you recommend not to use the water from the pool for drinking? Well, there's two reasons. The first is, it's filled with chemicals that are hazardous to your health. And so you don't want to drink salt water for the same reason you can't drink ocean water if you have a salt water pool. And you don't want to drink the level of chlorine that's available in the other kinds of pools. The second reason is that it's very unlikely there'll be any water left in anybody's pool. And so if you're counting on drinking water from the pool, it's not going to be available to you. There may be a few inches, perhaps as much as a foot at the deep end, if you're lucky. 
Uh, so it's, it's not really available. Another place where there's, there is water that you might want to address having, not as your primary supply for emergency water, but as a place that's already there, is your hot water heater. And in California, most hot water heaters you can access at the outside of your home. And uh, for years, the states required that they be strapped with two straps so that they're secure and don't fall over in an earthquake. And that law was passed to minimize the fire hazard after earthquakes. Because hot water heaters used to fall, the gas would start leaking and there'd be a fire. Uh, so if you're interested in doing it, I strongly recommend that, number one, you make sure that whoever built your house and installed the hot water heater strapped the straps, like the ones you saw in the film, because the odds are very high you already have straps, into the studs of the house, not into the drywall. So that's number one. And then you may want to consider spending 10 bucks and putting up another third strap, because it's a, uh, usually for most people a source of 50 gallons of potable water. Yes? Yes, I was interested. Uh, I was interested in the illustration of the couple lying in bed and uh, having you, them cover their faces with the pillows. Um, what about danger from the, uh, the ceiling and, and stuff like that? That appeared to me to be a very vulnerable position compared with diving under a table if you were in the dining room or something like that. Well, here's the logic of the recommendation. California is home to scientists of all kinds. Some of them are in the health and medical professions. And some of them have done epidemiological research investigating how people who are injured in earthquakes get injured. And a prime reason people get injured in earthquakes is when they're moving when the ground starts shaking from one location to another location. So thinking about recommendations to a whole population, the whole population would be safer and there'd be fewer injuries if people simply stayed where they are because relocating is hazardous. If you're interested, it would be absolutely better to get under a heavy table or desk. Uh, if, if you're really interested in maximizing your safety, whatever you have next to your beds now, get rid of. Put a Parsons table for end tables, you know, the legs and open space under the table, and next to your bed as end tables so that uh, if there's two people in the bed you sleep in, you both have one to get under. Uh, so that's fundamentally the reason. The other reason for covering your face is you can live with, God forbid, a broken leg. Or you can live with a cut arm. You can't live with a crushed head. And so the part of your body to, be, to protect the most is your head, and that's why the recommendation from the medical community is to cover your head. And then there's another element. When the ground starts shaking in this particular event, it's not likely many people would be able to move anywhere. Oh, let me just say one more word about that. Earthquakes come with warnings. How many of you didn't know that? Three people didn't know that? There's two kinds of waves in earthquakes. The first wave is a P wave. And what a P wave is, is your body knows, you think, is that an earthquake? And you sit there and do nothing. <laughs> and that's the social psychology part. And what you're saying is, well, if it really starts shaking bad, then I'll do something. OK, well, if it's this earthquake, you'll feel the P wave you'll have two to three seconds before the really severe shaking begins. And when that shaking begins, it'll be severe, and it'll be almost too late for you to engage in a protective action. So what you can do is when you feel a P wave, now watch yourself the next time you feel it, you'll think of me predicting that you're still gonna do nothing. 
But when you feel a P wave, what there is to do is take that as an opportunity to get under a heavy table or desk. Uh, is it nature great that we get that much warning? People in other places might get more warning than we do, but given the physics of where we live, we'll have perhaps three, three seconds of that kind of warning. Uh, yes, sir. Current building codes, what type of uh, structural requirements do we have today and what do they anticipate as far as Richter scale earthquake that that building can sustain, let's say a residential house? What are they, the maximum that the current code anticipates? Um, California's building codes for earthquakes are the best in the nation. They're probably not as good as the building codes in Japan and not as good as the building codes in New Zealand. But California has taken earthquakes into account in how it's built things for decades. However, the building code constantly changes. And what that means is the building code when your house was built, let's say in the 70s, isn't the same building code that was used when houses that were built in the 80s or 90s were built, and those aren't the same codes that were, are in place today. The most recent update of the California Building Code happened in 2004. Now, what the building code does in California is one thing. We build to one standard, allegedly. And that is that buildings aren't supposed to kill people. It doesn't mean the building won't be damaged. It doesn't mean if it's a high-rise building, you'll be able to get out of it. It doesn't mean that it's going to look pretty when it's done. But they're supposed to not cause death. Now, of course, some still do. So statistically speaking, older structures are more vulnerable than newer structures that have taken advantage of the newer building codes. Or older structures that are looked at by a, a seismic engineer that knows about such things and are retrofitted uh, can do very well in earthquakes. You can fix all the gaps that might exist, but there's no guarantee. But in general, in general, uh, the housing stock in California is as good as it gets, at least in our country, for going through earthquakes. And single-story wood frame houses are by far the best because the wood enables them to move. Now, imagine what happens to plaster walls when the, when the wood is doing this. But non-ductile buildings, that means they don't move, they're rigid, don't do well. Buildings are supposed to move in earthquakes to do well, and, and wood buildings do that. So in general, um, uh, uh, the newer the house, the better. If it has wood studs behind the plasterboard, that's better. Uh, if you've had a seismic engineer come out and look at it, two or $300. Uh, they can tell you exactly what's going on. However, uh, there's no clear way for you to predict what's going to happen to your house, really. Because damage depends on other things besides how well the building is built or retrofitted. It also depends on shaking intensity. And there are different kinds of shaking intensities in earthquakes. In Rancho Mirage, the experts have said we have two shaking intensities in our city from this earthquake, one higher than the other. And uh, it also depends on how long the shaking goes on. Because the longer you shake something, the more prone it is to damage. And as you heard in the film, uh, and I can explain a little bit more about that, we'll have severe shaking in this earthquake for uh, 90 seconds. And that'll be followed by another 30 seconds of additional non-severe but still violent shaking as the seismic waves bounce back and forth from mountain range to mountain range. So they'll get trapped here. Uh, that sounds terrible for us, but it's actually lucky for the state as a whole. <coughs> you don't want seismic waves radiating out. And in most of our country, seismic waves travel 
across states, but in California they don't. They stay very uh, localized. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, let's take someone over here. I have a number of questions, but I don't want to, wish to take the whole evening here. Uh, just to follow on what you said, the movement we would experience here then is an up and down movement? If this were to happen right now? Or uh, would we be, be moving sideways? No, well, okay, you're asking about what kind of shaking will you experience? Yeah, if we okay. were sitting right here now, right now. All right. Fundamentally, there are two kinds of earthquakes. One is uh, the kind we're going to have is a, a strike-slip earthquake. And that means when one side of a fault line <laughs> moves and the other slide, side of the fault line doesn't move. The other kind of earthquake isn't that. It's when one side of the fault gets thrust up and the other side doesn't. The worst thing to happen and why the earth is, has tsunamis like we had a few years ago that killed a quarter of a million people is when you have a really big earthquake under the ocean and it pushes up because that pushes the water up and that creates created the Indian Ocean tsunami that killed all those unfortunate people. Ours will be the kind that slides. How you'll experience it, your perception of it. There'll be as many different perceptions of what the shaking is like as there are people in this room. Now, how many of you have heard other people saying or have said yourself, oh, when that earthquake happened, it had a pop, and then it didn't shake initially, and then it started, and then somebody else said, no, it wasn't that way at all. It was done. And that's why eyewitnesses make such lousy witnesses in a court of law, because people's perception intervenes. So how it'll shake for you, it'll be like this. It'll be like if you went home and filled your bathtub with water right to the top, and then took a cinder block like your backyard wall may be made out of and drop it right in the center of the water and then looked at the waves that are created, that's exactly how the ground's going to move and where the shaking will come from. I'll take one more question from you. And I should say to everybody, if there are questions after this part of the evening ends and after the, uh, we declare this over that any of you have, I'll stay in the lobby or out in front of the library and answer as however many questions you have. Thank you. Uh, this one's more prosaic. Uh, the fastening of, of images, of, of paintings or something to the wall, there was a reference made to earthquake hooks. How do these differ from the typical uh, hook that you use? Earthquake hooks differ from typical hooks that you'll use in one fundamental way. Earthquake hooks will keep the picture where it is any other kind of hook won't. And in an earthquake like ours, those pictures probably, if they're not up well, and there's more to say than just the earthquake hook, will become projectiles in the room. And that's why you want to cover your head. What would you cover your head from? It's not just from the ceiling breaking, but it's from your favorite cherished knickknacks, vases, uh, uh, years ago, I would have said ashtrays, uh, pictures, mirrors uh, falling on you. An earthquake hook is a square block. It has like a Chinese puzzle in it that the wire that the picture is hung on gets down in and it can't get out. But then the bottom of the picture also needs to be affixed to the wall with uh, something like Velcro. And uh, I... Uh, procrastinated about doing things like that to my own home. And uh, I know Lucy Jones, and we were at a meeting of the Seismic Safety Commission, and I said I didn't have my pictures and mirrors secured. And she looked at me and said, how long have you lived in California? So what I did was call up uh, a vendor, in fact, he's here tonight, and said, come out and do my house. And uh, the instructions I gave him was, I, I don't want to try to save my knickknacks. In fact, if I go through this earthquake, I deserve all new knickknacks. <laughs> it's not about that. I just don't want them to kill or injure me. So they're, and, and they are inexpensive. Uh, and you need to really fuss around when you're going to repaint the room, but that's what it takes to live in California safely. 
Does that answer your question? This is my brother, so I want to call on him or I can't live with him. Can we give him a mic? And then I'll get to everybody else. If we experience a foot of water in the swimming pools and all the block walls are knocked down and the roads are tore up, impassable, how is the fire department, <clears throat> emergency services, and police department going to help us? That's a good question. So first of all, be rest assured that emergency services will do what they've done in every other disaster worldwide and work unabashed for three days and three nights without a minute of sleep and become very vulnerable themselves to psychological trauma because they weren't able to save more people or accomplish more good or do more of their job. The problem's gonna be that the number of emergency workers, police, and firefighters that we have available to us, the, the, their capacity to respond is gonna be so far exceeded that most of the demands for their services will go unmet. That's why you need to be prepared. That's why you need to minimize the amount of injuries people have by minimizing how your house will go through the earthquake. Uh, because we can't uh, expect uh, uh, people from other places to get here very soon. Because we'll, uh, the roads will be disrupted. Let me just give you an example of one. So how many of you have ever driven on Interstate 10? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have ever driven on Interstate 10, let's say from here to LA, and gone through a town called Whitewater? Okay, if you want to know where the San Andreas Fault is, the next time you're in Whitewater, look straight down. They put Interstate 10 on top of it. And when the shift I was talking about happens, the uh, west side of the fault, that's the side towards LA, will move approximately 20 to 40 feet to the north. The other side of the fault, the side of the fault that Desert Hot Springs is on, is going to stay exactly where it is. Now, that shift is gonna mean you won't be able to drive on Interstate 10. That's just one example of how roads will be disrupted in this particular event. But as is the case in all events, don't get too scared. California is really good at responding to earthquakes. The people from other places will get here eventually, but for the period we're saying seven to 10 days, you're gonna be on your own. And it's gonna be like camping in the desert. So do what you need to do to survive, to drink what it is you wanna drink. Uh, and to, I just thought of something else I wanna share with the woman who asked a question earlier, and eat what you wanna eat and eventually they'll get here and eventually it'll all be rebuilt and you'll never know that an earthquake happened here. But there's that interim period. One of the things I have in my earthquake supplies is I particularly am fond of that old fashioned Bombay dry gin. <laughs> which I had to forego this evening in order to come here. And I have a few bottles wrapped in bubble wrap. I also have a portable small ice maker and a portable small electrical generator so I can be shaking the cocktail shaker. Where do you live? <laughs> okay, who's over here on this end? I've been working the center row a lot. But. Going back to preparedness, um, protecting yourself, a couple years back, I was told that if I didn't have a sturdy table to go under, to go under the door frame um, or a frame in the house, would you recommend that? Absolutely not. Do not get in a door frame. Getting in a door frame is an old wives' tale, and the state has been trying to stamp it out for half a century. 
and having no luck. I don't know where it originated or where it came from, but it's kind of like a statewide urban legend. In fact, if you get in a door frame, you increase the risk of being injured two ways. One is being whipped back and forth and hitting one side of the door frame with your head and then the other. Or being slapped by the door as it does this. Do not get in a door frame. And I know a few years ago, we had somebody from one of the news channels in the desert get in a door frame every time they had a pretend earthquake and it was part of uh, the 2008 shakeout. I don't know where they got that idea, but it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. And I might also say equally absurd is getting in a new urban legend zone of safety called the triangle of life. There's no such thing as a triangle of life. However, there is somebody who believes there is, and they believe it by rescuing people in earthquakes in other countries where the structures have totally collapsed. If the structure totally collapses, the, people, the few people you find alive are in some area that didn't get squashed, which he calls the triangle of life. So if you live in Guatemala <coughs> or Nicaragua, yes, get next to the side of your desk. But if you live in California, get under. Because what there is to do is not the same around the world. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh-oh. Everything she has is glass. Well, you know, you have time to go shopping. <laughs> yes. Is there any chance of liquefaction? The I question heard that it's a possibility in the Mecca area. Yes, there is a chance of liquefaction. And let me point out that the uh, uh, state and our federal government funded multiples of millions of dollars, the best scientists in the country, to create a scenario to estimate damage in this earthquake to give to the emergency responding community so they could take steps ahead of time to get prepared to deal with this. And one of the things they did was estimate liquefaction potential. To make a long story short, the closer you are to the Salton Sea, the higher the probability of liquefaction. Now that makes sense, it's kind of intuitive. It's probably soggy right there, water does seep out of things, of holes, that, that's what that is. It's just a catchment basin for a uh, lot of water that went there once. Um, and I, I wouldn't be worried about liquefaction in Rancho Mirage. But remember, I'm a social psychologist, so take my advice about these things with a grain of salt. That's based on what I've heard others say. Yes, in the back. Few of us do not live here, but live in other parts of the valley. Yes. I happen to live in a mobile home. Could you speak of any special preparations for those of us who live in mobile homes? Yes, mobile homes unfortunately are particularly vulnerable to earthquake damage. And how they tend to be damaged historically is that they tend to fall on their sides. Now, you can th think this way, well, how far do I have to fall? And in, in which case you could say, so I'm not gonna worry about it. On the other hand, the pipes and things that go into mobile homes once the home folds are particularly vulnerable to igniting and starting a fire. So that real hazard with a mobile home isn't so much that it'll fall on its side, which isn't a healthy way to live, but uh, the fire that could ensue uh, after they, they rupture and tear open pipes. Um, there are a couple of approaches. Uh, one that the other laws contradict, and seismic safety has always had a problem implementing things that need to be implemented because of other rules and other part of government bureaucracies. You could make mobile homes as safe, maybe even safer than single family wood frame homes by taking them off their wheels, digging a two or three foot hole to submerse them in, and 
uh, you have somewhat of a garden level mobile home to live in. Perfect solution, you could line that with concrete. However, then you lose the tax break of having the wheels on it. There probably are rules in the city you live in that you can't do that, and they have to be on uprights, and, and uh, so on and so forth, for reasons other than seismic safety. Uh, and beyond that, I have to say I don't know how to secure a mobile home above ground so that it's safer. I do know this, that we have run um, something called the Hazus Program, and the hazards program was put together by the federal government. It contains every structure in America. Can you imagine? And can be run for hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes. And we ran it for this earthquake. And in this earthquake, the uh, mobile homes are particularly subject to damage. Not a big surprise. So what you might do is consult a structural engineer. I'm sure they have applications and solutions uh, for people who live in mobile homes. You're just talking to the wrong fellow. Sorry, I didn't know the answer to that question. And it, yes. Are those of us who live closer to the mountains, especially at risk from subsequent rock Okay, that question, because she didn't have a mic, was are people who live close to the mountains at extra risk to rock slides? The answer is, it depends on how close you are to the rocks that'll come down the mountain. So the answer to the question is, if there are rocks on the mountainside that are loose, could you expect them to come down in this earthquake? Yes. Um, would you, would you want to give up a beautiful home with a spectacular view that abuts up against a gorgeous place, which is why you moved here in the first place? I wouldn't. Um, however, what I would do if I were you, in a couple of years, this will be available. Uh, have any of you heard of the Cruise Project? The Cruise Project is basically this, some private entrepreneurs. Now, wouldn't you know, the private sector would come up with this and not government. Not that I'm throwing criticisms at anybody. Uh, have detectors that, remember the P wave I was talking about? That can detect the P wave and sound an alarm in your house immediately. And that would say the following. Earthquake, duck, cover, and hold. So if there were boulders above my house, I'd buy one of those in my house and I'd train me, even though I'm a social psychologist, I still need to be trained, to when that gizmo does what it does, that I run where there aren't boulders. <laughs> By the way, that technology, it'll be the first system in America, the first place it'll be is in our valley and it will be used to give people in Los Angeles 30 seconds, maybe a minute worth of warning. But for us, it'll only be a few seconds. Palm Springs, by the way, gets 12 seconds warning. Just that we'll be closer to the likely epicenter and point of initiation. Any other questions? Scott? At the beginning of the uh, session, the mayor was indicating that we haven't had a major quake on this end of the San Andreas Fault since the 1600s. Do you know why it's been so long? Yes. Not bad for a social psychologist to know that. <laughs> Earthquakes happen because faults move. And if the faults were all uh, smooth and well-oiled, they'd move one inch a day. The west part of the San Andreas would move one inch a day. However, faults are not smooth. Um, and they get stuck. And when they're stuck, stress builds up. Where we are is where the, what we call the San Andreas fault bends. So fundamentally, the San Andreas Fault is the plate boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. And the North American plate goes from 
fundamentally desert hot springs to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And the Pacific Plate goes fundamentally from desert hot springs to Japan. And that plate is moving to the north. And it goes wherever the Pacific Ocean touches land. So it's the same plate boundary they have in Chile, that they have in Mexico, that they have in Oregon and Seattle and up in Alaska. Same plate. Here we call it the San Andreas Fault. Why? Because seismologists like faults. And they like to name their own. So our segment is called the San Andreas Fault. It's fundamentally a straight line from Chile to Alaska, except in two places. In Southern California, from the Salton Sea to north of the San Fernando Valley, it turns left and then goes back north. And that makes it get stuck. And it's been stuck since 1682. Now, they've done trenching on that segment of the fold. And what you can see, if you're a paleo seismologist when you dig a hole, is how many times the sediments have ruptured and how often, historically, there have been earthquakes. And our segment of the San Andreas Fault, the one that goes through white water, the one that's by desert hot springs, the one that's along the Salton Sea, has a large earthquake every 150 years or so except since 18, 1682, it hasn't had one. So we've been overdue since the year 1830 something. And that's why Lucy Jones, if you ask her, the best way to ask Lucy anything, she's very approachable is taking her to lunch or cocktails. And, and if you ask her, what's the probability of this fault having a large earthquake? All she'd look at you and say is, consider the fault 10 months pregnant. <laughs> so in your minds, when is it time to get ready? And what we're asking you to do, really, is get ready to go on a camping trip for a week or 10 days. That's all. And fix the things in your house so that they don't hit you or the people you love when they get loose. That's basically what there is to do. Or if you have an old house or a, a mobile home, and I don't know the answer to the question about how you make it safer, get someone who does to come by and share that information with you. Or have your homeowners association find out how to deal with those things. Because in HOAs, every house is the same age. So what you find out for one applies to others. So basically, our fault stuck. And when it cuts loose, our earthquake will simply be a Lollapalooza. Then this will be the safest place in America for earthquakes <laughs> because all the stress will be relieved. We could actually market that. We have a question here and then next to him and then you. Oh, okay. All right, good. I knew I'd mess up and not call on people. Yes? I just want to make a suggestion that as many people as you can to go through the CERT program. Each city offers. And, and I went through it, and it's amazing what you can learn. Okay, good. Let me say this. Once again, the federal government, largely sponsored by FEMA, put together a program. The program is called CERT. It's being a certified emergency, certified emergency response training. And what you learn there is everything an individual needs to know about what to do after disaster strikes. And uh, the city of Rancho Mirage makes CERT training available. By the way, FEMA only is funded by Congress to run that program for $1 million a year, which is why people who do the CERT training have to pay for it, except in Rancho Mirage the city will pay your cost to go through the CERT training. And if they stop doing it after I said that, I bet they start again, but I don't really know. Uh, so I would absolutely recommend that if you're interested in getting the CERT training, sign up for it tonight. They have registration tables out in the hallway. 
I have a much cheaper way of seeing the Andreas Fort. If you go up to Living Desert and pay $10 entrance, you can go to our viewpoint and you see the long line, green line of palm trees, and that is the Andreas Fault. But that wasn't my question. You answered yeah, You're going to get a lot of people at the Living <laughs> Desert. <laughs> and I'll be in line. <laughs> good. I'll take you on a tour. Okay, good. I'm a docent of 17 years there. And my question, the first one I had was rolling out of bed, and you've answered that. But then I wondered, there are a lot of important people living here, lots of former presidents and so on, lots of wealthy people. There are helicopters. Won't they be coming in with supplies and, and uh, safety, security, with, in helicopters for us? The answer to your question, and I'm answering this through, having worked with the director of the state's emergency earthquake component in the California Emergency Management Agency. We actually wrote part of the scenario that described this. The answer is no. It's not likely that helicopters will be coming to our rescue. And there are many reasons why. It's very likely that people will be coming to our rescue, but it's most likely, based on the information we had two years ago, that they won't be getting here for five to seven days. And when I say they're getting here, uh, what I mean is a water tanker will get here or a 18-wheeler will get here and they'll have canned water from the Budweiser Brewery because they always can water in beer cans after earthquakes, bless their hearts. Uh, like that, It's not like life goes back to normal, but that's when outside help will first get here. We are on our own until that happens. We rely on the Valley very heavily on emergency services from Riverside County. Riverside County, first of all, California has probably the best emergency response community in the country. And Riverside County probably has the best one in California. So it's as good as it gets. They won't be able to get here. Now, here's the problem. The problem has happened in other earthquakes. It happened in the Loma Prieta earthquake when the Bay Bridge collapsed in San Francisco. The media gets involved. And the media creates in other people's minds what the disaster was like. The media created in the mind of the Federal Emergency Management Agency that the earthquake happened in 1989 in San Francisco. The epicenter was in Watsonville. The whole town almost got creamed. Nobody went there. Where did they go? They went to San Francisco, where they did have some damage. But relative to what happened in Watsonville, it was cosmetic. Now, in this earthquake, we know. Uh, that half of the dollar losses, and they'll be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, all of Southern California will be affected. Half of the dollar losses, at least $100 billion, will be lost when Los Angeles catches on fire, the way San Francisco did in 1906. We even know the parts of, of LA that are prone to catch on fire. So do the water distribution companies, so do the fire departments, and people are trying to do what they can do, but there's a limit to what you can accomplish. Um, and we also know that given how structures, high-rise structures were damaged and then not adequately repaired after the Northridge earthquake, that there'll probably be the collapse of several major engineered high-rises in downtown Los Angeles. Now, what would you bet is going to attract the evening news crews? Collapsed high-rises with LA burning in the background? Or a bunch of rich people who can't cool their gin in the Coachella <laughs> Valley? <laughs> 
Well, she said, I'm too much, but that's it's really the way it happens in, in a minute. But I want to get this fellow. He had his hand up first. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Doctor. Um, having listened to you very carefully this evening, we recently arrived from England and we might be going back. But no, seriously. <laughs> But very seriously, can I just say, can you convince us this evening that the city of Rancho Mirage and the Cochella Valley per se has got the necessary national support and budget to give us the extra care that we will need in terms of medical help, fire and rescue, possibly more armed police officers, definitely the ability to communicate with each other. All our comms have now gone down. We need wireless mesh systems. We need access to satellite telephones. What you're actually telling us in a very professional way is, hey, you lot, you're on your own. We've got to sort it. And what more can we do as a city of Rancho Mirage to look after ourselves? Uh, we're doing it tonight. And that is, recommending to our neighbors that we as individuals prepare. The world will come to help. This is not Louisiana. It's not gonna be like what happened in New Orleans. Uh, this is California. California has its emergency response communities put together. And California, unlike Louisiana, knows what to do when a disaster strikes. We have in this state computer models that estimate dollar losses in earthquakes that have the answers out before the ground stops shaking and the governor is making a federal disaster assistance request to the president with the numbers. Louisiana never did quite figure out how to do that. However, what I am saying is, it'll be a while before they get here. And the reason it'll be a while is major modes of transportation will be significantly disrupted. There'll be no way to commute here. Now, there is some good news. Here's the good news in the domain of transportation. No train, no boat. No car. No one's going anywhere. Where will you be when this happens? Right where you are when the ground stops shaking. However, the estimates by really good engineers are that uh, the Los Angeles airport and the Palm Springs airport runways will be usable. That's really good news. However, if you have a private plane, you'd probably end up having to break the law to fly out because they'll close airspace and it'll just be for air transport. But it'll be a while before they start coming here. The priority will be Los Angeles. But they will get here. And even if they came right away, there's a limit to how many planes can land in Palm Springs. Where are you going to park them? Well, it's a tiny airport. Good questions. Um, how about way in the back? I would like to know if the animals, the pets, can sense the P waves before the humans can. People have been speculating about animals being able to sense not the P waves, but changes in electromagnetism that happens, some people think, prior to an earthquake. Now. What NASA has done is they actually can photograph electromagnetic fields and are doing that with some of the satellites that they have. Uh, where earthquakes have happened, they've gone back in time prior to the earthquake. They could have given hours worth of warning for the Northridge earthquake before it happened. They just didn't know to look or how to interpret what there was to see. Now, it's possible that animals, you know how much better dogs are at smelling than we are, might have something about them uh, that enables them to uh, sense changes in electromagnetism. The nation of China was so committed to this idea, they had a national, nationally wide program 
<coughs> to have individuals sign up to monitor pets, to look for signals before earthquakes happened. Nothing ever came of it. And the United States uh, thought that it should uh, <coughs> pursue some research on this and funded somebody at the University of Colorado at Boulder to the tune of a million dollars from the National Science Foundation to study cockroaches. <coughs> and Senator Proxmire, who used to like to find things like that years ago, found out about it and went ballistic, <laughs> wasting America's money studying cockroaches. Well, you know, it, does, it does make you laugh. So to answer your question, some people think animals can, yes. Uh, it's been examined somewhat, and nothing has been formalized about it. So it's not available to us as a technology. Have time for one more question. <coughs> Who would like to have it? Well, there he is. I didn't really have a question. What I wanted to do is say that if you want to see the fault, Go up to Joshua Tree and get to the viewpoint. And it'll show you, there's a, a line up there that shows you where, uh, where that fault is. And you can see it from up there. OK, good. Uh, another recommendation about a tour of the fault. Well, let me say to those of you for whom I was able to answer a question, thank you so much for asking them. It's been. <laughs> It's been my pleasure uh, to spend the evening with you, and I'll be outside the room when this is formally over to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, doctor. And one more hand for Dr. Dennis Maletti. Uh, tonight, I'm sure you will all agree that you heard from one of the foremost authority in earthquake preparedness in the world, probably. So we really appreciate him being here. Doctor, I wish I had a bottle of Bombay gin to give to you. <laughs> but in place of that, uh, we have a proclamation from the city of Rancho Mirage and the city council thanking you for the years that you've helped us with preparedness and certainly helping all of these individuals and thanks for everything you've done for us. You're certainly welcome. Thank you.